before we get started into to the deep dive here, I want to give you three quick marriage tips from Pastor Aaron. These, these are freebies. I encourage you to write them down. I don't have time to really get into these and dive deep into them. Uh, but number one is to have fun. Always have fun. Laugh together. Have that dance party in the living room when no one's watching but you two. Go on that date night. Have fun. Laugh together. It's going to be great. Number two, this is for the husbands in the room. It could be for the wives, but this is generally more for the husbands. When your wife asks you to keep the house clean, all right, maybe you got company coming over later, uh, maybe you got somebody coming to check out the house. When, she, when they ask you to keep the house as clean as possible, just go play golf, all right? It's four to five hours. You're not in the house. That's going to stay clean if you're not in the house. Just go play golf. It's going to work out best. And the last one, while you're folding laundry, all right, if you're folding laundry together, I'm telling myself here a little bit, fold a piece of laundry and then zone out on the TV for about five seconds, ten seconds. If you do that in between every piece of laundry, it turns out that, that she's going to fold most of the laundry and you get away with not folding very much. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I just want to start off on a light note um, I, that may or may not be some of my strategies in the past of getting away with things. Um, but we all pray with me because obviously I need it up here this morning. Uh, Father, thank you for this day. Uh, God, and thank you for the privilege of being on this stage. Uh, God, thank you for the privilege of being a part of this church. Uh, God, I love you. God, let everything that is from you this morning stick and, and be ingrained in, in our people, God. And everything that is not from you, God, do, do be quickly forgotten. I love you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So in Ephesians 5, this is our starting point this morning. It says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. And so that's our starting point this morning, that, that, that our marriages are an illustration of the Christ and the church are one. And as I've gotten the privilege of, of officiating different weddings and for some really good friends and for, for some really great people, um, I like to ask people a few months in the marriage, even if I didn't officiate, I just got like to ask this question. What's the most surprising part about marriage so far? It could be good, it could be bad, it could just be unexpected. And a lot of people give very similar answers. That man, like, it's a little bit different adjusting my schedule to somebody else all the time. That, that my actions and my, my planning affects another person all the time. Um, and I asked my friend Pete Hardesty this question. He's been married for seven months. Um, Pete is the author of a book called Adulting 101. It's a great book. I recommend it for all young people, um, or even if you feel young still, or if you feel like you don't have it all figured out yet, um, it's a great book to get ad <clears throat> Adulting 101. But Pete said this when I asked him that question. He said, seven months in, I'm surprised at how hard it is, but also at how good it is. I'm surprised at how selfish I am and how much I want to control and choose what I do every day. I didn't realize how much I cared about things that don't matter. I have also been surprised at how tender and caring my wife can be and how much she can encourage me. You know, and this, this surprised me. When he sent this, I was like, what? Because Pete is one of the most selfless people I've ever met in my life. He is, he is consistently putting himself above others. He's consistently putting him in situations where he is, he is below others, even though he's really um, the boss of the boss of the boss. When I was on Young Life staff, he was the boss of my boss's boss. Um, and he just felt like a friend. Um, he is selfless. Um, and he's, but that stuck out to me. He said he's surprised at how selfish I am. And it stuck with me. And it kind of made me look back on the other answers that people gave me. And I'm like, man, that's what every couple I've asked this question were trying to say. But Pete got married a little bit later in life, so he's a little bit more self-aware maybe. And maybe he's a little bit just more hard on himself. But man, like surprised at how selfish he was. And it surprised me. And it got me thinking that we don't, we don't realize how, how selfish we really are until, until our actions and everything that we do affects another person. And how, how we care about the little things a little bit too much. I, and Pete just expressed that um, so clearly. And this can show up in our, in our marriages in a lot of different ways. But this morning, I just want to talk about there's one way that I think this shows up in our marriages. In Ephesians 5, it says this, Watch what God does. And then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents, mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him. Learn a life 
of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. And it says, love like that. And so I'm, and I'm starting to piece this thing together. God, God, if my marriage is supposed to be an illustration of the Christ in the church, if my marriage is supposed to model that, and this is how Jesus loved extravagantly, not cautiously, so that he could give everything of himself, not to get something from my wife, what does that look like in my life? What does that look like in my marriage? And so, so this morning, I want to I talk about what that looks like in our marriage. What does it look like to love extravagantly? What does it look like to give everything of ourself, not just a part of ourself? And, I, and as, I'm, as I'm tackling this, I, I read a story in John chapter 2. And you might be familiar with it, but if you're not familiar with it, that's all right. Jesus is at a wedding, and you know they're having a good time at this wedding because they're running out of wine. They're, they're running out. They're having a good time. And Jesus' mom comes to Jesus and is like, Jesus, you, you need to do something about this. Because if you ran out of wine at a wedding feast, it was humiliating. It was, it was disgraceful. They, you would be dishonored because the host ran out of wine. And so Jesus' mother comes up to him and is like, hey, you got to do something about it. And Jesus is like, no, it's, it's not my time yet. It's, it's not, this isn't the right time. Um, but like mothers often do, she, she, got, she got the people and said, hey, do what he says. He's going to take care of it, even, even when he said he wasn't going to. And so what, this is what happens is Jesus goes and he, he, he finds these basins of water and he turns water into wine. And, and imagine this scene of, of you're, you're at a wedding and they're running out of, out of, out of wine and there's important people here. And the, the, the wedding, the, the master of ceremonies g- grabs a cup out of this water basin and he's about to drink it. And, and all eyes are on this, 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 the master of the wedding feast. Is he going to spit it out? Is he going to laugh? Is he going to disgrace the host? And this is what happens. It says the, 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 the master of ceremonies, the, the person running the wedding, takes the drink, and he, he drinks it, and he says, a host always serves the best wine first, he said, then brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. So they were expecting the lesser wine, that, that once the good stuff was over with, that, that, that Jesus would, would bring up a, the, the not-so-good wine, but, but instead... Jesus brought the best. Jesus, Jesus brought the best of the wine that had been in the wedding. And there's nothing to, to say that during the wedding that the, the wine was bad. The wine was obviously pretty good because they were running out of it. And so the wine that they had already had was, was pretty good. But when it came to when Jesus' mother asked him to help, Jesus brought his best. And notice Je- Jesus said no at first. He's like, no, it's not my time. But I think it's because it was Jesus' mother that asked him. It was a relationship that was important to him. It was a relationship that he held dear to him. And it got me thinking, this is how Jesus is loving his mom. This is how Jesus is loving the church, is that he is giving his best. That he didn't, he didn't make it lesser. He didn't say, all right, we've gone through the whole wedding feast, and now I'm, I'm going to give just, just the mediocre. They went through the whole wedding feast, and what was left at the end was the best that Jesus had. And so this morning, I want to I talk about love versus leftovers. And, and, and this morning, I'll, I'll tell you a little, little story from my marriage, from my past. Um, when we first got married, I, I was doing a lot of stuff. I was on Young Life staff. Um, I was uh, working at a place called the Epoch Dream Center. And then this crazy church plant was happening that wanted me to be a part of their leadership team called Lift Church. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. And so I'm doing all three, th- three of these things, and then, you know, from the outside looking in, you, you see it, and you're like, man, man, he's doing Epoch, which he's, he's helping under-resourced students in the area. Man, he's doing uh, Young Life, which is reaching out to lost kids in the, in the city. Um, and then, he, then he's a part of Lift Church. We all know who, how good Lift Church is, right? Yeah, you know. Um, and, man, from the outside looking in, man, he's killing it. But what was happening was is, is I would go to work, and Epoch was an after-school program, and I'd be there until... Um, 7 o'clock at night, and then always a kid had to be taken home. Um, so I'd take the kid home, and they could be in Fruitland, they could be in uh, Mardella, they could be in Salisbury. And I wasn't getting home until 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And this worked for a little while because my wife was in school and she was studying. Um, but the more and more we, we lived out this out, the more and more I realized, man, what I'm bringing to the table is not my best. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm bringing my leftover hour hour and a half because my wife would go to bed at nine o'clock shortly after and so that gave us an hour 45 minutes together each day when we're both awake 
And we started to realize, like, man, like, I'm not bringing the, my best to the table. Man, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm bringing my leftover time. That I'm, I'm doing all my important stuff. I'm doing my job, my ministry, and then what I'm giving my wife is my leftover time. And then what I realized, really, is I was giving her my leftover attitude. I was getting home. I was tired. I was apathetic. I was, I was emotionally drained. I was spiritually drained. I was physically drained. And what I was giving her was not my best. And so we'd get home. I'd, I'd be a little grumpy. I'd get home. I'd, I'd just want to hang out on the couch. i just want to eat dinner and go to sleep. And you can imagine the tension here. You can imagine the, the frustration. And, and my wife never said a word. She, she, she didn't express her frustration. She loved me through it. And, she, and she, she just lived life with me. But I started to realize this um, about a year ago, that, man, this, this can't continue. That, man, I can't keep giving my leftovers. And so what I ended up doing is I ended up leaving my job at the Epoch Dream Center, which I loved. I loved my, my, my work there. I still love them there. I still go and I mentor there. But I realized, man, if, if I want to give my best, if I want to love my wife, like Christ loved the church, I need to change something. And so I left. And, and so to make this a little more clear, I, I have lo- some props up here. Love versus leftovers. Let's see what we got here. We got cloth. We got a bowl. Let's see. This is what we call safety. It's a knife wrapped in a, in a paper towel. It's nice and safe. <laughs> um, and so what I would do, I, I'd get home, right, and I'd, I'd cut this up. I got my, my peppers. I got a nice potato there. I think I, think I got it. Got an onion in here. And so I'd, I'd prepare preparing a meal, right? How many of y'all would love if you got home and someone's got, got the meal prepared for you? It just feels great, doesn't it? And so I'm, I'm cutting, you got to cut up the, the pepper. Wouldn't it be something if I cut my finger off up here on stage? <laughs> and you got you to gotta chop them up, right? <laughs> well, we'll see what happens, right? And you chop them up and you, you dice them up. And I think put them in the bowl, and then, then you get an onion, and man, it's, it's going to be good, right? How many, of y'all, how many of y'all love to cook up in here? Yeah, yeah? You know, for the sake of time, I'm not even going to peel this, this onion. You're not going to want to do that when you're, uh, when you're cooking. And then, oh, man, you got some potatoes. We got some peppers. We got some onions. We got some potatoes. How many of y'all know diced up a potato, right? And you come home, and maybe you, you put these in the bowl. And look, this, this, this stuff is magic. Any, any of y'all use this, this natural seasoning? Right? We, I put this on absolutely everything I think is great. You sprinkle a little of this in there. Maybe you cut up some Italian sausage, and you, and you, you, you put it all in a pan together, and it's good. Man, I, I'm, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. And, and I, I put some labor into this, this work, and I'm, and I'm preparing a meal. But what I was really doing is I was getting home, and this is why I had left. It's, I just, I got, this is what I got. And this is what I was giving my wife. Now, now what, what do you think she'd feel more loved with? If I prepared a meal and I cooked it and I, and I gave her my best and I put my love into this. Or if, I pull, or if we're like, hey, what's for dinner? And I pull a leftover PB&J out of my lunchbox. And I just gave her my leftovers. Oh, don't, don't worry, I got, I got a little piece of granola bar left too. And, and this is what I was doing in, in my marriage is, is I wasn't preparing. I wasn't giving my best. What I was doing is I was grabbing my leftovers that I had from the rest of the day, my leftover attitude, my leftover anger, my leftover frustrations, and I brought it home. I brought my leftovers. So what do I mean by leftovers is that you give your, the best of your energy to your work, your hobbies, your friends, your other family, and what's left is what you give your spouse. What's left after work is what you give to your spouse. And this is what we think. We think, my work needs me. My, my friends, they need me. My, my, my coworker, that, that crisis over here, it needs my best. It needs all of me. And this is really easy to justify. It's really easy to, to think about it and, and, and explain it away. And the, the first way that we justify it, and this is a little colder, is we think, man, my wife, my husband is, is a grown man, is a grown woman. They're just going to have to adjust. That, that what I'm doing is important. My work is important. What I'm doing is it should take precedent. And my, my, they need to adjust. They need to change. We justify it by, by saying it's just a season. Come on, that's such a great Christian excuse for so many things. 
when you're not living the way you're supposed to. Ah, it's just a season. We say it's just a season, but here's the problem with a season. A season can tank your marriage. A season can tank your marriage. And, and I've never seen a, a marriage that was terrible the whole time. Most of the time, the problem is a sustained period of time where things are not the way that they're supposed to be. And some would call that a season. And here's the problem with a season. In, in Proverbs chapter 4, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. What happens in a season, when you're distant in a season, when you're not bringing your best for a season, your heart begins to harden. Your spouse's heart begins to harden towards you. And then we see this scripture that above all else, guard your heart for everything flows from it. Now everything is now flowing from a hardened heart. And now your words start to become shorter with your spouse. Your attitude starts to become more volatile with your spouse. When we don't bring our best to the table, when we're bringing our leftovers to the table. And this is another way we justify it. I hear this all the time from young couples, that they're my person. They're, they're the only person I can express my full emotions with. They're the only ones I can express my frustrations and my angers and, my, and bring my full self to. They're, they're my safe place where I can be that person, which is a great thing to have. Don't get me wrong that you need that safe person where you can talk to. But if that's all that we're giving our spouses, we're, we're not loving them the way Jesus loved us. If that's all we're giving our spouses, then, then, then their heart is going to harden. In Proverbs chapter 29, it says this, A fool expresses all his emotions, but a wise person controls them. A fool expresses all their emotions, but a wise person controls them. And that, I think that doesn't, is not qualified with your significant other. And you know, for strangers, we, we give our best. For strangers, we, we, we put on a smile. For strangers, we're in a good, upbeat attitude and we're joyful. But when it comes to the person that we pledge our life to, to the person that we said that we're going to love to our dying breath, we give our leftovers. We, we give our, our, our not our best. We give our frustrations. We give our, our negative emotions. To me, that doesn't make much sense. And there are times where we need to say our frustrations. There are times when we need to... To, to give our leftovers. And there are, there are maybe a, a day, a, a week where, where man, man, my, my best is just my best and it's what I got. And, and, and it's our spouse's role to, to lift us up with the Lord in that. But if this is what we're consistently giving our spouse, man, we need to give them our best. Don't underestimate the power of coming home and greeting your spouse with a smile. That man, when you come home, that the best that you can do is greet them with a smile. I think it, it can change the, the atmosphere. In Matthew chapter 6, it says this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I can see that. And, I, and what, I, what I hear is where, where you give what matters most to you, where you give what's most valuable to you, that's where your heart's going to be. Where you give your best, where, where you're giving your best emotions, your best energy, that's where your heart's going to be. So where are you giving your best this morning? And if you find yourself, you're like, man, I, I don't know. I, I might be giving my leftovers, but I'm not sure. There, there's three telltale signs that you might be giving your leftovers. And so pay attention to these. The first telltale sign that you might be giving your leftovers is that you are consistently coming home apathetic or angry. And here's an, an easy test. Are the first couple phrases, the first couple words out of your mouth uh, to your spouse a complaint? And maybe you're not even complaining about them, but maybe your the first phrase, your first conversation is a complaint about your day. And, and it, there's nothing wrong with expressing those things, but is it the first thing that you say? Is it the second thing that you say? Are you consistently coming home apathetic or angry? The second telltale sign that you might be giving your leftovers is that you're consistently finding reasons not to be home. Are you, are you going to the gym a little too often, maybe a little too long, and not spending that time with your spouse than you than you're supposed to? Are, are, you, are you going to go play golf a little bit too much lately? Ha, has girls' night become every night in your household? Are you consistently finding ways not to be home? And I think this could go both ways. Is your spouse consistently finding a way not to be home because they know they're coming to your leftovers? And so this is an honest conversation to have with your spouse either way. And the third, third way, a telltale sign that you might be giving your leftovers it's that you're a grouch with your spouse, but you flip a switch for everybody else. Now, are, are, you, are you a grouch over here when you're talking to your wife, but as soon as company comes over, 
welcome. And it's, and it's good and it's fun, but as soon as company leaves, it's back to the grouch. You might be bringing your leftovers to your spouse because what that communicates to your spouse is that you are able to turn it on, you are able to adjust, you are able to be joyful and kind, but it's not worth it for them. That's what it's communicating. And, and most likely you're not communicating that on purpose. But that's what's communicated when, when you bring your leftovers to the table, when you flip a switch for other people, but not for, but not for your spouse. In Ephesians 4, it's, it's listing these kind of negative actions and negative emotions, and it says this, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. It doesn't mean we can't be in a bad mood every once in a while. It doesn't mean that we can't be our real selves. But what the scripture is showing us is that we can make an intentional effort to give our best to our spouse. That we can intentionally say, I got all this going on, I got all these other emotions, but instead, I'm going to be tenderhearted. I'm going to be kind. I'm going I'm to be forgiving. I'm going to speak gently. I'm going to be slow to speak, quick to listen. Instead. And so this shows us that we can intentionally treat our spouse well. And in 1 Corinthians, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great chapter about love. It says love is patient, love is kind. And it goes down this list of what love is. I encourage you, go down that list. Is this how I'm consistently treating my spouse when I get home, when I wake up, when, I, when I'm interacting with them? Am I bringing my best to the table when, I, when, I'm, when I'm with my spouse? And so you might be thinking, what, all right, I've, I've been given my leftovers, but, but I want to give my best. And here, here's what happens when you give your best. When you genuinely bring your best to the table, is then your spouse wants to bring your, their best to the table, Right? When you bring your best to the table, your spouse is going to want to bring the best to the table. That, that, that it starts with you. You know, John Wesley famously said this, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from, for miles to watch you burn. That if you light yourself on fire with passion, that people are going to come for miles to see you. And I think that, that includes your wife, it includes your husband. That if, when you start to bring your best, when you are on fire for your marriage and when you start to bring your best to the table and you, you leave your leftovers for somebody else, that they're going to want to be their best too. And the second thing that happens when, when you bring your best to the table is I promise you, you're going to experience triumph, victory, and satisfaction like never before. Triumph, victory, and satisfaction. In Ecclesiastes 4, it says two people are better than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But three are even better, for a triple-branded cord is not easily broken. And y'all might be thinking, who is this third person up in my marriage? Right? That third person, as the, as the band joins me and I begin to close, is the Holy Spirit as we bring our best to the table, as a husband brings their best and a wife brings their best, and they're this illustration of, of what Christ and the church look like. And the Holy Spirit gets involved in this thing that, that it reminds me of if, if, we're, if our marriages are a picture of Christ and the church. Christ, Christ and the church are another picture of Israel and God's covenant in the Old Testament. And when I look at the Old Testament, I see when, the Israel, when Israel doesn't bring their best, Things don't go very well. But when Israel brings their best and God brings his best, man, they triumph over every enemy. They see restoration in their people. They, they, see, they see gaining ground where they thought they would never gain ground. They, they see revival in, in the next generation of Israel. And I'm telling you, if you bring your best and your spouse brings their best, and you come together, you let the Holy Spirit get in the middle of this thing. You let the Holy Spirit guide you. You let the Holy Spirit lead you. That your, your marriage will experience restoration. Your marriage will experience revival. Your kids are going to notice. Your kids are going to say, man, they're, they're loving each other a little bit differently. Man, I want that kind of love. Your kids are going to learn to expect what it looks like to be in a, a happy, married, God-centered marriage. That, that you're going to gain ground where you never thought you would. You, you might not think that, that he would ever open up and be that vulnerable, but man, when you bring your best and you allow the Holy Spirit to guide your marriage, man, he's going to open up and be more vulnerable with you than ever before. 
man, you, you think, man, we're, we're never going to take that chance. We're never going to, we're never going to go for that goal. But when you bring your best and your spouse brings your best, man, we let the Holy Spirit guide us. You're going to gain ground in ways that you never thought you would. That we bring our best to the table. That God's got triumph, victory, and satisfaction beyond what we can think. And so as I close, you, you, you find yourself giving your leftovers. What do you do? How do I change it? The first thing you got to do is be honest with yourself and be honest with your spouse. Have this difficult conversation. Talk about it. In James chapter 5, it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That if we would confess our sins to each other, that if we would have those difficult conversations. Come on, there are times in my marriage where I've had to have weird awkward, tough conversations. But man, after those conversations, our marriage is just, just it's like a launch pad. It takes off because we're willing to be honest with each other and confess our sins to each other and have those hard conversations. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your spouse. It doesn't have to be calling your spouse out. But if you all agree together to say, hey, I'm, I think I've been doing all right, but have I given, been given my leftovers? Or maybe it's, hey, like, I, I know I haven't been giving my best lately. I might have been giving my leftovers. How can I do better? Having that real, honest conversation with your spouse. Number two, identify the times these attitudes and behaviors come out. Identify the times. Maybe it's when you wake up in the morning. Maybe before you get out of bed, you need to identify, man, I need to get myself right. And this is what I encourage you to do. Pause. Seek the Lord's face. Pray before you interact with your spouse. You're getting home from work. It's been a hard day. Sit in your car for an extra minute. Pray. Pause. Seek the Lord. Get your heart in the right spot before going in the house to interact with your family. Maybe you're picking up your kids from school. Park, park a half mile down the road before you get there. Take time. Pause. Pray. Seek the Lord's face. If I can encourage you to write something down, maybe put it on a note card and put it on your dashboard before you go in the house. Pause. Seek the Lord. Pray. Pause. Seek the Lord. Pray. And the last thing is, number three, you might have to change your habits. That You, you may have to leave the office a little earlier every day. You, you, you may have to cut your workout time in half to give your best to your spouse. All right, you're playing golf three times a week. You might have to do it one time a week. All right, girls' night is three times a week. Just do one time a week. Change your habits. If you're giving your leftovers, pause. Seek the Lord. Pray. How can you change your habits? How can we give our best? And today, as we're leaving, I want to pray for you. And we're going to do something a little different. If you're sitting next to your spouse... I want you to take their hand. And we don't always do this at lifts, and, and you might not be comfortable doing it in front of other people. That's all right. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. Just, just hold their hand. Because I want to pray for you. And, and if you feel like, I want you to pray with me. Because I, I want to pray for the Holy Spirit to, to be in your marriage. And if you're here and you're single or, or, or engaged or, or dating and your spouse or your significant other isn't with you, that's all right. Begin to pray for them even now. When I was single, I consistently prayed for my future wife. Begin to pray for your future spouse, for your future together. And so, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, thank you. God, thank you for the marriages in this room. God, thank you for, for the examples in this room, God. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit right now, God, to, to come in the midst of their marriage. God, that your Holy Spirit would guide them. God, if anyone has been given their leftovers, if anybody has been given less than their best to their spouse, God, I pray that right now you would reveal that in themselves. God, that you would, you would illuminate where we, where we can be better for our spouse. God, where we can love them like you loved us. God, where, you can, where, we, where we love them and be a true illustration of how you love the church. Holy Spirit, I ask that you come and be in the midst of this place. God, every spouse, God, every married couple in this room, God, that you would guide them. God, that you, you would bring them closer than ever. God, that intimacy would be better than ever. God, that, that, that vulnerability would be better than ever. God, that their communication would be better than ever. God, Holy Spirit, come and be in 
the midst of these marriages. And with every head bowed and every eye still closed, if, we're an, if our marriages are an illustration of us and God, and we're talking about bringing our best to our marriages, my question this morning, have you been giving your best to God? Have you given yourself to God? And this morning, I don't want to leave this place without giving you a chance of saying, that's me, I want to get closer to Him, I want to start giving my best to God. You know, in Romans it says, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of not bringing ourselves to God is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's a free gift. All you got to do is take it. All you got to do is ask for it. And you know, it says if you believe in your heart and confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And in a minute, I want to pray with you. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up. I just want to know who I'm praying for and give you a chance to say, that's me. I want to be close with God. It's a free gift. And so if that's you this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, will you throw your hand in the air? You don't have to keep it up. You don't have to, to come up here. Just throw it in the air and, and, and put it down. I see your hand in the back. Now I want to pray with you. If, if that's you this morning, even if you didn't raise your hand, if that's you online and you want to put it in the chat, that's me. I, I want to pray with you. I want, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And so we're going to say it together as a church. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Today I want to give my best to you. Take my life. I believe that you are who you say you are. The Son of God and that you came for me. I want to have a relationship with you. From this day forward, I live for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.